Well, I want to welcome you to today's conversation. I am thrilled for our conversation today. And when you think about a lot of the confusion around scripture, a lot of the confusion that we've been recently discussing is around how churches are supposed to be structured. And what is the pattern? Is there a pattern? Uh, why do we find ourselves at times stuck in a rigid theological structure? How do we get a sense and really help people heal from the trauma that is caused when there is a rigid theological system as it relates to looking at pattern? And is there a better way to interpret scriptures? I think many of us, we would say that, you know, biblical interpretation is about, you know, a continued partnership with the Holy Spirit. But the question is, is where is the Spirit leading us when it comes to interpreting the scriptures? Today, we will be having a scholar joining us and who's going to help us to get a sense for how we might work through some of these tough questions. And I want to remind you, if you're, you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. It pushes the videos up in the algorithm. Also, uh, hit the bell notification so that you will not miss anything coming up. Another thing I want to say really quickly is that I've got a new series that's going to be released on Patreon. If you're not a Patreon subscriber, please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber. I've got a new series called Off the Record. And as well as many of you know that many of my conversations that I have, many of the interviews are controversial to say the least. In fact, this year I've had some experiences where uh, things got pretty intense because of the content that is covered. And so I've got a new series that will allow me to put sort of a main interview on YouTube and in some more of the more controversial, more of the personal questions that will be in the off the record interviews. And we're going to actually with John Mark, he is going to be the first off the record interview today. And I'm really excited. And I also want to just say, listen, I know some of you, I've read some of the comments uh, in social media are frustrated because some of the content is put behind a paywall. Uh, you have to understand our society is at a different level of, of toxicity at the moment. It is not really, I mean, I would say in some ways, respectful and safe places are becoming a thing of the past, unfortunately. And so the Patreon community is really designed to have safe interactions and, 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 and respectful conversations with one another. You also will get early access as well. Okay, without further ado, John Mark, welcome to the channel, my brother. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Appreciate the invitation, Kyle. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so brief, briefly tell us about your conversion and why you became a scholar. Ooh, well, I typically don't, I usually don't call myself a scholar, but um, <laughs> uh, if you want to say that, okay, fine. But I grew up in Churches of Christ. I grew up uh, with a godly mother and a godly father. My father was a minister. So I was matured in the community over the years, um, and that maturation um, took hold. And I became a Christian when I was about 11 years old. I, I was baptized when I was about 11 years old. And so I've had a faith journey that has been um, constant uh, from my earliest memories to the present. So it was a long kind of uh, discipling, you might say, by my family and by the community in which I lived. And I owned that faith in my teenage years and grew up into it. So much so that um, my intent was to be a missionary. In fact, I learned German in high school and I got a degree in German in college uh, so that I could become a missionary. And that was what I wanted to do. And I've always had that missionary impulse in me. Um, and the story is that you know, my wife died suddenly uh, when we were planning to go to Germany. Uh, my wife died suddenly. And um, I, I didn't know what to do with that. And I didn't know how to respond to that. I was 22 years old. Um, first grief in my life first lament in my life, first struggle in my life, basically, at, at that kind of trauma. Um, and I decided, you know, I didn't have any, we were planning to go to Germany, and we already had it set up, and we were going to go and be uh, in Munich and Vienna, and maybe in, behind the eastern, behind the wall. This was back in the 70s. Um, and so all that fell apart when she died. 
mm. because I didn't have my partner. Um, and I didn't know what to do, so I took the insurance money from the life insurance and said, okay, uh, I'll go get a doctorate. And I kind of fell into scholarship in that way. Uh, but I've always tried to get out of it, actually. You know, I, there were several times in my life when um, I actually attempted to move out of the academy and into a missional mission somewhere in the world. Um, and every time I tried, a, a door would just slam shut on me. And it was like God saying to me, no, I got you where I want you. Just stay mm -hmm. right here, you know. Uh, and so I, I finally... About 20 years ago, I finally accepted that. <laughs> for, for about 20 years, I kicked against the bricks, you might say. You know, I, I don't, this is not my life. You know, this is not what I've always planned to do. Um, so scholarship is really secondary to me. Uh, I think scholarship is important. We need to read the Bible well. We need the archaeological background. We need the linguistic background. We need, we need that community of scholars to translate the text for us and help us understand the text. Um, but it has always been secondary to me. Um, the primary in my life has always been more missional, mm. more about the growth of the kingdom, more about the church. I've, I've tried to prioritize the church over the academy and let mm. the academy serve the church rather than dictate to the church. Um, right. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, you can call me a scholar if you like, but that's not the best word I would want to use to describe myself. <laughs> but, I, but I understand where you're coming from, and I can appreciate that, you know, that, that we do need scholars. Scholars are important, um, but they only serve a greater end. They don't, they mm. don't serve themselves. It's not, the scholarship is not the goal. Um, so that's kind of so my general story. Why did you write Searching for the Pattern? Well, to serve the church. I mean, that um, I, I wrote that book uh, primarily because I had uh, a lot of former students and a lot of people in churches and church leaders struggling with how to read the Bible and how to understand the Bible. And they were, they were often kind of confined to a particular way of reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. And as they tried to read the Bible that way, it just got more and more difficult. And especially, um, it became more difficult in terms of unity and how do we live together? How do we keep from dividing over and over again? Because the way we read the Bible is we're trying to find the right church doing the right stuff. And now we're arguing over what the right stuff is and who the right church is. And when you get into those kinds of discussions with a confined hermeneutic or a way of reading the Bible, it yields division rather than unity, and it creates bitterness and hurt and wounds. So I was asked by a lot of people, what book would you recommend that I could give to my elders or I could give to my, uh, that, I, that, that I could use myself in terms of struggling? Um, and I said, you know, really, there's not one single book that I could just hand you and I took that as a challenge to, okay, write that book. Write the book that I would then, when I get asked that question, how do you read the Bible differently? And how, how does it differ from the hermeneutic I grew up with or the way of reading the Bible I grew up with and the expectations I had placed upon the text? How do I read it differently? Hmm. And um, I said, well, okay, let me do that. Let me see what I can do about that. So one of the complaints has always been, you know, if you, if you don't like that old hermeneutic, you don't like that blueprint kind of hermeneutic uh, that was typical of Churches of Christ my, in my youth uh, and for many years and has been typical of Churches of Christ for, you know, over 100 years. Um, what, if you get rid of that, what do you do with the Bible? I mean, it, it was kind of <laughs> like a blank, you know. Yeah. Uh, if I if I don't do it the way I've always done it, I don't know what to do with it, right? Mm. Uh, so what am I am I just rejecting the Bible then when I reject that hermeneutic? No, we're just oh. going to read it differently. And and which way of reading it is more conducive, more 
appropriate to how the Bible does its own self, right? Mm. How it does its own reading. Uh, and so I took up that challenge uh, because I wanted to be able to hand a book to, to people who ask me that question rather than kind of, well, if you read this article or you read this article or if you listen to this speech, you know. Nah, I wanted to kind of say, okay, here's the problem and here's a possible way of moving forward uh, with a different way of reading the Bible uh, that still takes the Bible seriously and takes the Bible uh, so seriously that this is our guide. This is how we know who God is by mm -hmm. what Scripture tells us. This is how we know who Jesus is by what Scripture tells us. And, and this is how we know who we are to become because we're guided by Scripture. And so I'm fully committed to being guided by Scripture. But the problem is often um, in the way we read Scripture. We make it into something that it isn't in order to make it so we're comfortable, so that we know we got it right. Uh, and and that, that's a problem. Yeah, I, I love it when people say that they they wrote something because there wasn't a book, there wasn't a resource to address the very issue that they're getting bludgeoned with. Mm, <laughs> and yeah. so it came out of necessity. It, it was organically produced. It was a yeah. need. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I, I mean, I never set out to write a book on this. Um, but it just kind of reached after, you know, I taught a course called Theological Hermeneutics for Oh, for 25 years. Wow. And um, I always thought, well, maybe I should write this up, you know. And it just didn't, just wasn't a priority. And it became a priority in the last five, six years because I, I kept getting a lot of questions. Because how do you, you know, when you start dealing with questions and controversies and issues and, and the culture's changing and people are trying to say, well, is this really what the Bible's saying? You know, is... Um, you, you have a lot of interest in, okay, are we doing this well? Are we reading the Bible well? And so there was um, um, a, a rise of need is the way I perceived it. There was a greater need for this kind of book. And the, the response to the book has been pretty, I mean, it gets some negative criticism, of course. Every book does. But the re general response I get from uh, many readers is, you just described my world. I've been mm. living in that world, I, and I didn't know how to break out of it, or I didn't know I've been moving in that direction, but I didn't have the language for it, or, mm. you know, those sorts of things. So hopefully it's been helpful to a number of people. Well, we're going to jump in, guys. Today is going to be more of a classroom experience. I know most times it's super dialogue heavy. I want to save the dialogue until after we can be given some teaching. I, and I'm a student today as well. I, I brought my, my notepad and so forth, and I'm ready to be a student. So I'm gonna have PowerPoints up on the slide so you can see, I think adults and many people as learners are visual. And so we're going to be working off of that. Well, you know, the, um, the method that I grew up with and was just ingrained in me is that we use the Bible to find out what we are required to do. And the way we read the Bible in order to find out what we are required to do is to search the Scripture for commands that we are supposed to obey, for examples that we are supposed to uh, emulate, and to fill in the gaps with necessary inferences, all right? Uh, and, and so it was um, pick up your Bible, start reading, find a command. Okay, is that command for us or is it for them? Uh, what does it mean for us? Uh, if, there, if there's no reason to, to limit it in any way, then we just assume it, it's for everybody. So if a command is there, that is not limited by its context or its specificity or its culture. If it doesn't have some kind of explicit limitation, it's a command, you do it. 
Mm. Example, you know, if we find the apostles doing it, hey, it must be okay to do that. But then the question is, well, if they did it that way, are we, is that meant to be the only way you do it or mm. the way you have to do it? Um, and so there was a question about, okay, is this just an approved example or is this a binding example? Mm. And then inferences, oh my word, you know, how do you know if it's a necessary inference or not? Um, how do I know that I'm not projecting onto the text what I think it should say rather than really deducing from the text what it actually what it says but inferences are always stating more uh than the text actually states right so it so it uh, it's a part of every hermeneutic that we use these sorts of markers i don't care who you are when you're reading the bible you're going to encounter commands you're going to encounter examples and you're always going to be making inferences that's just part of the interpretive enterprise that we're always um, inferring what we think it implies, you know, or, um, and so the question then is, is, how do we determine whether it's necessary or unnecessary inferences? So I think whether, whether you're a classic kind of um, restoration movement person who really bought into the command example and inference, everybody uses it. Even the book by, um, Richard Hayes, Moral Vision of the New Testament. He talks about rules, paradigms, and principle, which is another way of saying command, example, and <laughs> inference, right? Oh, everybody uses this language. So I, I don't think it's that we, we reject command, example, and inference. And this is what some people misunderstand about what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying reject command, example, and inference. No, we need, we need those tools we need those ways of seeing the text because the text does come to us with imperatives and the text does come with us come to us with approved examples you know where that was a good thing they did right not a bad thing but a good thing uh, and and we always are always we're always drawing inferences so that's not the that's not the problem the problem is not command example and inference the the problem it seems to me is what we're expecting to find when we read the text. Mm. That we, we expect the text to do something. And what are we expecting the text to do? Now, at a very general level, hopefully we can all say, we expect the text to form us into disciples of Jesus. I, I hope that that's something everybody can affirm and say, yes. Absolutely. We want the text to form us into disciples of Jesus. Right? Now, moving beyond that, though, in what way does the text come to us to form us as disciples of Jesus? And here's where we get two paradigms. And we could probably talk about other paradigms as well, but for our purposes, we'll just talk about two paradigms. One paradigm is we come to the text to be disciples of Jesus by um, implementing the specific details of the early church, to reproduce the early church in, its, in all its details in the present. And so if we expect to be disciples of Jesus and to be authentic disciples of Jesus, then we have to be in the right church, doing the right things in the right order, with the right <clears throat> motive, with the right purpose. We're, we're very much concerned about getting it right. And I can understand that. I grew up with that. I, I, I can appreciate the need to be faithful. We all want to be faithful. Right? But in this desire to be faithful, we, we brought a paradigm to the text or a framework to the text to meet our expectations rather than what the text was expecting to give us. Right? So I'm coming to the text with, okay, Lord's Supper, you know, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so I'm thinking, well, if he told us to do it, then he must tell us when to do it and exclusively when to do it, and how often to do it, and how to do it. 
And what's it supposed to look? I mean, so we go to the text, start looking for all the details, right? Jesus told us to remember him uh, in this meal. And so now we want to, we, we say, okay, uh, it, like, like when God gives us a law, do this in remembrance. God's going to tell us how to do this law, right? And when to do it. So we read the text uh, as a pattern to reproduce. We read Acts chapter 20 as a, um, a text that says upon the first day of the week they came together to break bread. Well, they must have done that because they were required to do it, right? That's what we're, that's what we're looking for. What are we required to do here? And so when we read Acts 20, verse 7, we say, oh, they did it on the first day of the week. And Jesus commanded, do this in remembrance of me. Oh, they must have been required to do it on the first day of the week. Mm. And since we don't see anywhere else where they did it at any other time, that must be the only day they did it on. Although Acts 2.46 says they broke bread daily, but that gets into, okay, what does breaking bread mean? Uh, so the pattern hermeneutic, or that blueprint is what I wouldn't call it. I want to call it a blueprint pattern hermeneutic where uh, we expect the text to answer all our pertinent, what we would call essential questions about how we do church. And when we see in the text an example, we have... We, we, have to, we have to make a decision. Is that just something they did that was a good idea to them? Or, and that it was a helpful thing for them, an expedient thing for them? Or was that something they were required to do in that way at that time? Mm. How do we get behind to, to discover whether it was required or not? See, so we needed a, a framework for... Um, making decisions about what is required. And so here's, here's the example I use uh, that, that actually, um, actually comes from an early Restoration writer by, J. S., by the name of J.S. Lamar in his book on hermeneutics. And he puts it this way, the Bible is like a field of stones. It's just scattered data, right? So you go into the Bible to find the right stones so that you can put it into the pattern of the temple. So you're looking for the stones that are going to erect the temple, right? Construct the temple. So we go around looking for the stones. We find this stone A, stone B, stone C, and we take it over to the pattern and we put it in, you know, block A, block B, block C, and we build the temple. We construct this temple. We take commands, examples, and inferences from uh, commands and examples from all over the field, and uh, that we call the Bible, and stick it in there. And then when we got holes, <laughs> where well, wait a minute, the pattern should tell us this. You know, it should tell us how to do that. It should it should answer this question. When we got holes, then we do inferences, right? Oh, and we yeah. we we infer the inf we infer the stones that are not there. And so we get this nice temple that we built. But the point is, we built it. <laughs> it's not there in the text. Right. We built that temple. We constructed it uh, out of the text. And when we read the text, we didn't read it um, necessarily in its context or in, within the story that it's telling We picked up stones from different parts of the field, and we picked up that stone that says, well, is this required? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, this command's required, put it in there. Uh, this one, uh, build an ark. No, that's not required. Right. Or, uh, oh, here's another one, greet one another with holy kiss. Eh, we can turn that one into a principle. We don't have to do it exactly. You know. Uh, you know so we do all that kind of stuff, um, which means we're engaging in some hermeneutical discernment as we pick up these stones. We're not just picking up the stones and plugging it in. We're picking up the stone and saying, Huh, does this work? Does this fit? Um, no, that was that was only said to Noah. No, we're the only Noah's the only one to build an ark, right? Except for some guy in Kentucky, he built one. But Noah's <laughs> the only one who built an ark, right? So, um, 
we do that all the time. And it's a, that's an appropriate thing to do is the discernment, hermeneutical discernment. But the problem is with the blue tent, blueprint hermeneutic, the tendency is to say, there it is, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to reproduce what's there. Mm -hmm. And when we reproduce what's there, uh, well, we, start, we need to start wearing head coverings, our, our ladies do. We need to greet each other with a holy kiss. We need to wash feet because you can't even support a widow if she hasn't washed feet. And widows mm. have to be 60 years old anyway. You can't support a widow who's under 60 if you're going to just reproduce. And that's the blueprint um, expectation that we're going to read the Bible and reproduce it by discovering the applicable commands, the binding examples, and the necessary inferences. But at every level, you're still making a decision, right? You're deciding whether this command applies or not. You're deciding whether this example is required or not. And you're deciding whether an inference is necessary or not. Um, which we erect this temple, but the temple we built isn't an exact reproduction, even though we might think it is. It's not an exact re reproduction. It's a hermeneutical reproduction because we have attempted hermeneutical discernment uh, when we decide which commands are cultural, which ones aren't, that sort of thing, you know, which examples are binding and which aren't. And so the, what we built is on a shaky foundation because mm. uh, it... We're trying to reproduce something here that, uh, that we're not actually reproducing. What we're actually doing is constructing a different thing that didn't exist in the New Testament. Hmm. So but what I would want to suggest, what I suggest in this book is um, that that uh, is not only problematic, but, there, uh, but it's, in, um, it's incongruent with the way the Bible comes to us in the first place. The Bible doesn't come to us with a pattern like a blueprint. I mean, nowhere in the New Testament do we have a blueprint for worship, right? I mean, the closest we come is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, and, and then it looks pretty chaotic. You know, whoever has a song and whoever has a teaching, whoever is, well, you know, that, we want to we want to follow that blueprint. Uh, we might have some problems, but... Um, mm -hmm. But we don't have that in the New Testament. There's no Leviticus in Ephesians, for example. Right. Right? Yeah. You know, there's awesome. nothing like that. And even Leviticus doesn't give you all the details about how to do things. Uh, for example, you know the Passover descriptions in the Old Testament, they don't include wine. Hmm. You look at Deuteronomy and Exodus, there's no wine in the description of the Passover. But when, when Jesus is sitting there eating the Passover, He's got, he's got wine. Uh, do we say, well, that's an addition to the rules? Well, for some people, uh, when you add to the rules, you're breaking the rules. Um, but Jesus added wine, or at least he participated in a Passover that had wine. They'd already added it years before, I'm sure. But uh, he's doing something more than what the Scripture said to do, right? Well, so how are we going to do this then? If, if it's not this blueprint sort of thing, I, what I suggest in the book is a theological, what I call a theological hermeneutic. Now, don't let theology, the word theology, get in your way here. Um, it's just a handy way of saying it's a God-centered hermeneutic. It's focused mm -hmm. on, on who God is and what God is doing. Theos, meaning God, Ology meaning the study of, right? So theological, the study of God. So it's a God-centered, through Christ, in the power of the Spirit, way of reading Scripture. In other words, or more, more basically, when I read Scripture, I want to know who God is. Right. And I want to know what, who God, what God is doing. And I want to know the story into which God invites us. So that we become participants with God. This was the creation from the beginning, right? God shared with us dominion over the creation. 
God shared his rule with us, so we are co-rulers with God. God shared his creative activity with us, so we co-create with God children, right? Mm. It was, you know, Eve said, with the help of the Lord, I have given birth to Cain, right? So we co-create and co-rule and co-act so that we are partners with God. We're definitely junior partners, to be sure, mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> we're partners with God, right? So from the very beginning of creation and through the whole story, God has invited us in to participate and to partner with, or as Paul called it in 1 Corinthians 3, we are co-workers with God, mm -hmm. right? Co-workers. And co-workers in, uh, in the ministry of reconciliation that God has called us into. Right? So when we think about it in, in that kind of way, I'm reading the Bible not so much to to find, okay, how do I do church and where are the specifics and where are the rules and where are the blue, where's the blueprint for the church? I'm reading the Bible to, to say, okay, what is the mission of God and how do I participate in the mission of God? Right. Because of who God is, right? So the theological hermeneutic is raising different sorts of questions. It's, mm. it's, it's raising the fundamental question of, how do I co-labor with God in conformity to the identity of God, which is revealed to us in Christ and becomes a part of us and disciples us by the power of the Spirit in the community of Christ. Right? So to me, that's the fundamental emphasis. Now, let me illustrate this because I know that sounds kind of uh, you know that that sounds kind of ambiguous. Well, I think the whole I think the whole point is to know the story well enough that it's not ambiguous. Mm -hmm. That is to know God's identity, to know who mm -hmm. God is, is to know what I should become, uh, and to know who Christ is, and to be a wow. disciple of Christ, to follow Christ. That's who I should become. Right. Wow. So it's not so much about what kind of church organization do I create uh, as much as what kind of community embodies the gospel of Christ mm -hmm. uh, and forms people into disciples of Jesus. That, that, that to me is the, is the, that's a theological point, not a where's the, the rule to reproduce. Right? So let me illustrate it this way with um, two texts. 1 Corinthians 16, um, verses 1 and 2, tells us that upon the first day of the week, um, Paul says that, you know, I want to make this arrangement with you, that on the first day of the week, you lay by in store, you, you, you share your resources. And I'm going to just presume, though it is by no means uh, a certainty, um, I'm going to presume that Paul's talking about some kind of action on a Sunday morning or Sunday night, you know, whatever, first day of the week action, where people pool their resources into some sort of common fund. Okay, that may be what he's talking about. It may not be, you know, because there's some real question about that. And this common fund is, uh, that is something Paul is going to take up when he gets there um, and deliver it to Jerusalem among the presence of witnesses who are traveling with him. So he has accountability. Um, now, the way I read that in my history and the way we have read it, at least you know, since the 1830s in the Restoration Movement, is that that was a required act of worship on every Sunday. That every Sunday, in order to be a true church, in order to be faithful to the apostolic example, and we would even say apostolic command here, that um, there should be a collection taken up within the community, put into a common fund for the purposes of the gospel. Right? Okay, so I, I heard constantly, every Sunday, we come to that moment in the service, and most people would read this text and say, God has commanded us to give every first day of the week. 
and that was based on that well okay that I can see how they get that because they're looking in part because we're looking for it we're looking for okay what are we supposed to do in church what are we supposed to do in the assembly what are the rules of the assembly and if it's not laid out for us we're going to find them because we're looking for them but if we think about first corinthians 16 in its context it's not about the common fund for the church that is taken up every sunday it's rather a new thing that paul implements for the purpose of collecting for this missionary um Hmm. fund right i mean was corinth a a, a legitimate church before first corinthians 16 I mean, if Paul said, y'all are supposed to do this every week now, um, looks like he'd have told him that before. Uh, looks like he would have told him that when he planted the church. I mean, if you plant a mm-hmm. church, you're going to lay out all the rules up front, right? I would think. Uh, but now he's got a new thing going here. But it's a relative thing. It's not even for every church because he doesn't command the Macedonians, as we learned from 2 Corinthians 8. He doesn't command the Macedonians. He was going to let them off the hook on this one. Hmm. Um, So this was not intended for every church and every time and every place. It was about a particular moment where Gentile believers could share with Jewish believers, where Gentile wealthy believers could share with Jewish poor believers who were undergoing a famine at the time as a part of a, a spiritual reckoning that is... In Romans 15, Paul said this was a way in which Gentiles pay their, um, I don't want to say debt so much, but they, they acknowledge the spiritual reality that has come to us through the Jewish people. And we honor them with this gift. Right? Now, let me contrast that. So that's kind of the pattern, that's the blueprint hermeneutic, where you're looking for, okay, this Yeah, it looks like it's just for them, but really it's for all of us because this command is not just for them. It's a command for every church everywhere throughout all history, even though it wasn't for the Macedonians within Paul's own world. Okay, so I guess we start giving then, right? Well, we don't need to do the church thing. We can, you don't have to do the church giving. We can just let go of that. Uh, we don't have to do it. Yeah, he's right. We don't have to do it, so let's not do it. You know? Let's only do what we have to do. Well, that's still look, working in that blueprint model. Yeah. Well, when Paul comes to this in 2 Corinthians, when the Corinthians are um, hesitating about mm-hmm. sharing with the Jewish believers, I mean, you've got these uh, Mediterranean, Greek, Gentile, wealthy people who are kind of hesitating about giving to this poor Jewish brown community, you know, in Jerusalem. How does Paul form them in a way that they become followers of Jesus in sharing their resources? Hmm. He doesn't command them. He says, I'm not going to command. He's very explicit about it. I'm not going to command you. So when he doesn't command them, what is, how, does he, how does he persuade them? How does he form them? Well, he uses scripture for one thing. He uses an example of manna in the wilderness in 2 Corinthians 8 and says some did not have too much and some did not have too little. And that's kind of how God wants the, way the, the world to work. It wants the community to work in this way, that nobody has too much and nobody has too little. Now, there's a principle to live by. Um, he also uses the psalm psalm 112 uh, when he quotes psalm 112 um, in chapter 9 talking about how he's the the blessed person scatters their gifts to the poor that this is who a blessed person is this is who the the one who is like god because in psalm 111 it's a description of god and if you read psalm 111 and then read Psalm 112, you'll see there they are a mirror of each other. And Psalm 111 describes who God is. Mm-hmm. Psalm 112 describes the person who's following God, mm-hmm. the one who looks like God. Mm-hmm. And so God is generous, so the one who looks like God is generous. 
Right. So you see what Paul's doing? He's taking the story of Israel and saying, hey, we need to be like them. You know, this manna thing and what God did in the manna thing. It's about what God did, right? Then if you want to be like God, listen to Psalm 112 and be like God. But the kicker for Paul is, do you believe this story we're talking about? The, the kicker is not, okay, the, final line, the, the bottom line is a command, so do it. You know, that's not the bottom line. The bottom line is, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Mm. That's the bottom line. And the one in chapter 8, the one who was rich became poor, so that we who are poor might become rich. And so I think what Paul is doing there is he's, he's not going to, He's not going to say, okay, we got a blueprint that we got to follow here and everybody has to give on the first day of the week and then we'll have some money to share with other people and that's how we do church. Now, Paul doesn't do that. What Paul does is we're living in a story, a story where we shouldn't have too much and no one should have too little. Mm -hmm. We're living in a story where we want to imitate God. We want to be like God. We're living in a story that is Christological, that is Christocentric. That is, we want to be like Christ. And he who was rich became poor. Right. So that we who are poor might become rich. Mm. Do you believe that story? Mm. See, I, I think that's what he's doing in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He's, do you believe this? If you really believe this story, if you're really going to be a participant in this story, if you're going to be formed by this story, this theology, you might say, by the mighty acts of God in Christ, by the power of the Spirit. If you're going to be formed by that, then you're not going to hesitate about this generosity thing. Mm. You're going to be generous people because you know who you are. And you, and you know who you are because you know who God is. And when the Corinthians do share their resources, you know, Paul calls that in chapter 9, verse 13, he calls it obedience to their confession of the gospel. How do you obey something when you haven't been commanded? Yeah, yeah, you, you're not command. He doesn't. He's not, he's not going. I'm not going to command you. I don't, I'm not going to command you. But when you do this, you're obeying. What? 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 What are you obeying? You're obeying by being conformed to the image of Christ, being conformed to the identity of God, being like God. And when we imitate God or imitate Christ in the power of the Spirit, then we are obeying our confession of the gospel. That we're obeying the gospel in one, another sense, another way of saying that. So the obedience doesn't come out of, out of a blueprint with detailed rules about how you do church. The obedience arises out of a conformity to Christ. Becoming like Christ, right? That's our obedience. And when we focus too much on that blueprint ideology, we lose something of the power of the call, the invitation to be a participant with Christ. Because it's so easy, and I know people don't want to do this, but it's so easy just to become a rule follower. Now, I would like, you know, for me, <laughs> I would love if, if Paul had said, you know, when you give, uh, you're, you can, uh, here are some rules. As you live out the gospel, here are some rules. Don't spend more than 30% of your income on your housing. You know, and if that rule was there, I'd say, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I can, I can follow rules, usually. Uh, so you give me the rules, 30% on my housing, 15% on my food, 20% in sharing with others. You know, you just give me some rules and I'll follow it. But that's not what Paul does. In fact, that Paul doesn't want to do that because he wants to, as he says in chapter 8, test the integrity of our love. And so the no rules in terms of that blueprint specificity kind of thing gives us the space to struggle and wrestle with our generosity. Mm. If I had just had a rule that said give 10% and be done, 
Oh, I can do that. And then I don't have to wrestle. I just do it. <laughs> but this way, I got to wrestle with becoming like Christ. I got to find right. a way. I got I to gotta understand and experience how the Spirit uh, in the life of God is forming me to be a generous person. So I don't have percentages attached. I have a sense of need and a sense of how the love of God flows through me and and where my treasure is. It's not in my stuff, but in but in who God is. And am I making sense there? Is that this is incredible? I, I'm telling you right now, John Mark. One of the things that uh, my my listener base has really been asking for is they're looking to create freedom for their spirit mm. through the Word of God. They don't want to have to go outside of God's word to try to feel free because we know we can't feel free. We know that the truth Mm -hmm. sets us free. And so people have been taught system, but not always kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so right now there is a deconstruction that's occurring that we need to hopefully do safely. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But there is a is a need for deconstruction so that we can understand kingdom. And so what I'm hearing you say, and I just there's so many things. One of the things I'm really hearing from you is that the story, the story is the part where we learn how, um, we learn who God is in the story. So what I'm really hearing from you in this is that if we drop a system in people's laps, well, that'll keep them immature. They won't wrestle. Mm. They won't grow. Right. And that's important to God from what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, well summarized. Um, systems have a way of giving us boundaries, but they don't give us depth. Right? <laughs> they don't give us relationship. They don't give us re- you know a sense of the heart formed. I can I can do the externals all all day long in, in some if I got enough fear in my life, you know. <laughs> mm. uh, so you give me the fear, you you uh, and give me the boundaries and and say or else, you know. Okay, I'll do that if I'm convicted sufficiently. Uh, but what I won't do is grow. Not necessarily. I might, uh, but not necessarily. But what God is calling us into is, is not just pay attention to the boundaries, but rather uh, calling us into relationship with God to become like God, to imitate God, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that, that takes wrestling. That, yeah. Even Jesus wrestled in the garden, right? Whether he was going to conform or not, um, and that wrestling is a part of what has to be a part of our our growth in Christ. Absolutely. I, I got a couple of questions. I got a million questions, if I'm being completely honest. But uh, okay. one of the questions that I have is, where do you see the restoration movement or restoration culture? I think that's probably the, one of the best ways. That, but Where's the restoration culture now? Hmm. Um, as it, and, and we know that there, there's a serious issue because there's a next generation crisis. Yeah, yeah. And what I'm noticing is that there are, there's an incredible amount of reactivity on two fronts. One is that people feel that the integrity of God's word is being, and I think we need to find different words, but deconstructed or minimized, and so people feel this very robust charge in commissioning to defend the the Word of God. Mm. Meanwhile, you have other people who feel so injured by what people thought they had figured out and what the Bible was supposed to do for their lives. In other words, people tried to get the Bible to perform in ways that it's not trying to perform. Answer questions it's not trying to answer, to your point earlier. And so there's these extremes of people who want to really defend. We got to defend the word. And then we find this other part where people are like, well, okay, I don't mind defending the word, but I don't want to defend the pattern. Mm, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so it yeah. feels like in restoration circles, there is a collision here. Yeah. There's division here. Yeah. No, I. that's a very excellent point. I think, I think that's exactly right, that we, we have multiple things going on in this atmosphere of deconstruction and reconstruction. And that, 
that struggle between okay a kind of a traditional blueprint patternist and this person who is um, um, kind of been wounded by that system and has um, and finds no joy in that system right. and is looking for 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 more or else they're just going to get out altogether right mm -hmm. if they don't find that Here, here's what here's my my one of my fundamental commitments uh, uh convictions i should say, I should say about the restoration movement and i think this has been true generally in my own history um I find when I talk about these subjects that when I stay within the story and I stay within the scripture, I get a hearing. As long as I'm, I'm saying, okay, the canon, the rule is Jesus Christ. Hmm. <laughs> um, and you say, well, that, you know, that, well, that's Paul. That's what Paul said in Galatians 6. The only time, you know, he uses this word canon he uses it twice, or rule, and one of the times is, is, is Galatians 6. And it's a rule before there's a New Testament. You know, there was a canon before there was a New Testament. And that canon was Jesus Christ himself, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think if we can talk about this in ways that we're both looking at the Scripture, and we're both seeing how scripture comes to us and living within the story of scripture itself, I think there's potential for healthy dialogue. Um, but, we ha but we both have to be, or whoever is involved in that discussion, we both have to be submissive to this scripture uh, and submissive to the categories that scripture brings to us rather than imposing our own categories. And I think that's true not only of the blueprint kind of thing, but it's also true of the deconstruction who wants to to read the Bible like a modern person, you know, and mm. and flatten the Bible in such a way that um, takes it out of its context. And when you take it out of its context and flatten it like a field of data, then yeah, some of these stones don't fit. Some of these stones don't work, and we're just going to throw them out and toss them. Um, so I think if we if we come to Scripture as a drama that we participate in, and we read it in a way that calls us to continue the drama, to continue to do and teach what Jesus Christ did and teach, as Acts one begins, I think we can come to some kind of conversation here uh, that uh, that to me can be very helpful. Now, you got extremes and, and there are going to be people who, people who are not interested in those kinds of conversations. Um, but I do think that typically people can sit down and read the Bible together and engage each other, inquire of each other, search the scriptures together. I, I hope that's true. It's been true in my experience at least. But I know it's getting more and more difficult because of the polarization, uh, political polarization, uh, a church culture polariz polarization, um, and that, you know, it creates suspicion. Mm -hmm. uh, it creates a lack of confidence in the other uh, and therefore a lack of loving one another. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's going to be hard. But, it, but, it, but there's also a, a resource available to us and that is to immerse ourselves in that story so that the main thing becomes the main thing, that is the imitation of Christ. If I could just get people to, to, to sit around uh, a circle and the main goal is to become like Christ, I, I think we can make a lot of progress on that. Uh, that can be very helpful. Well, this kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, I believe it's uh, Peter Enns' uh, incarnate analogy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that idea that um, Jesus was fully man and fully God, and so is the Word. Mm. And so that idea that we know that, that Jesus was the Word, and he was fully human and fully God. Yeah. So the Word of God is kind of a paradox, too. Mm. 
And when we treat it as though it's one or the other, um, we, yeah. <laughs> I find it, it, it's yeah. very difficult. Uh, as you had mentioned, there's a lot of holes. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, what are your thoughts about just kind of um, that thought? I think when, when we're thinking about uh, the divine and human dimension of the word, for some, you know, the blueprint kind of emphasizes the divine. So, okay, these are divine fiats. There's the rules. They're the, you know, that's the command of God. Go do them. Um, and the deconstructionists emphasize the human department dimension of right. it. Right. 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 Uh, that, it's, that it's situated in an ancient culture, in an ancient language, uh, dealing with ancient issues and a, a slavery culture, and et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, so that's very much a part of it. And, and I think that somehow we have to recognize how those two things come together. That, yeah, this is, um, this is a human culture, a human reality that Scripture participates in. That you see the human dimension. You see the human reality. Uh, you see the human style of writing. You see the human language, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. You, you see the human setting. It's in Athens, or it's in Corinth, or it's in Jerusalem, or it's, you know, you, all of that is about, yeah, the head, there's a historical context, and we have to take that seriously. We have to take that humanity seriously. Um, otherwise, we're just going to pick things out and put them on a, on a board and say, okay, do that. Yeah. And, and when, we, when we take it out of a context, then it creates its own context, right? Yeah. Like, go and do likewise, well, I could, I can create all kinds of context for that. You know, I got to know what what Jesus was talking about when he said, "Go and do likewise." Right? I just can't pick that verse out and and apply it to whatever else I want to apply it to. Um, you know, some you remember the old joke that um, after telling the story of Judas hanging himself, someone quoted the scripture, "Go and do likewise." You know, oh, no. <laughs> you know. Oh, so man. you can put things, you know, you can put things together so that they. They they have meaning, but they have a false meaning. You know, it, it, it's not what the it's intent. That's why that historical context is so important, and historical context has a way of deconstructing the blueprint model. Like First Corinthians sixteen, that context is not uh, is not adaptable to the blueprint model. And on, but on the other hand, what's the God thing here? Uh, mm-hmm. It's not just human. Rather, right. God is telling a story. God is revealing God's self, God's own identity, God's own purpose, God's mission, God's goal. And, and, and God is active in forming and moving us toward that goal and shaping us in Christ by the power of the Spirit. And so that story is the divine work of God. Yeah. Um, that's what that's what I want to draw out. I want to I want to know what that story is. I want to know what that mission is, so that I can participate in it. And it doesn't mean I'm looking for blueprint. It means I'm looking for what's God doing, and what is God calling me into. How can I partner with God in what God is doing? And that becomes the the primary interest in reading. So, I, you know, a very simple thing that I have at the end of my book is. When you're reading scripture, you can always ask three good questions. There's, always, there's three good questions you can ask of everything you read. Who is God in this text? What does this say about the identity of God and what God is mm-hmm. doing? Who am I in this text? What does this say about human beings and who they are? And how do I participate as a human being in what God is doing in the context of this text? I, I think it gets as simple as that. And all these rules kind of complicate uh, and make it um, make it so only scholars can read the Bible. Eh, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, right. I don't think only scholars can read the Bible. I think we all can read the Bible and ask those three questions at least, and become people who are formed by God's story. Mm. No, this is this is uh, unbelievably rich and. Um, I just keep hearing you calling us to story. And Mm -hmm. even I go back to the the way the Bible is even constructed is largely oral. And there was song. 
Like mm -hmm. this was integrated into, this was an embodied, and one of the things I love that you talk about uh, that we didn't get a chance to talk through a lot is the embodiment mm -hmm. of the message. Right, right. That's, that's, I mean, we have to enflesh Just like the story. Jesus. Yeah. Just like Jesus, right. The word becoming flesh, the story becoming flesh, right? So that we well, can become the story ourselves. Right. What what cultural? Let me ask this one, and you can you can hit this as hard or as as, as light as you want. What cultural issues? <laughs> oh, this wow. is kind of obvious, but it. What cultural issues have you seen the uh, restoration churches be, struggle with? Oh, <laughs> oh well, whew, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, right. I mean, there's several there's several to to think about. Um, you know, I think the race issue question has been a huge struggle um, traditionally, uh, whether it goes back to slavery uh, or segregation of churches, um, segregation of colleges. Uh, yep. I mean, got a long history of that. Um, that's why I put that chapter on race in the back of that book as an example of applying a theological hermeneutic. So I, I tried to address what I thought was a major question for us, but there are many others too, um, and and they all kind of get next together in some ways. I mean, politics. I mean, the, the role of a Christian nationalism or the role of a of a political right and left that divides the church, that we're dividing the church over Caesar. That mm. I mean, Caesar tried to kill the church. Well, we're killing it by dividing over Caesar. You know, that, that just frustrates me to no end because our citizenship is with the kingdom of God and we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, not not a political party or a political agenda. Um, now, that doesn't mean I, I want to advocate for justice. I want to advocate for, for righteousness, but it's the kingdom justice I want to advocate for and the kingdom righteousness I want to advocate for. Absolutely. Um, not not necessarily tied to any political will or political agenda or political person. Yeah. Uh, that disturbs me greatly. Uh, and I think that uh, that's where Caesar can kill the church, even when Caesar failed before. Ooh. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I really appreciate that. Um, it has been such a blessing for you to stop in and, and kind of be a professor <laughs> to uh, a group of students. You know, I, I John, I, I really mean this. We, there is a great hunger um, for scholarship mm. that is growing. Mm. Um, people want to, people want depth. Yeah. People well, want, you know, they want to be fed. It's, it's a, it, I mean, scholarship is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, but like anything, it can be abused and it can yes. create elitism and all that sort of stuff. But if we use it to serve the church, we use it to serve the kingdom, then it's a good thing. And uh, I'm glad to hear about the hunger, the hunger to know the yeah. word and uh, to follow the word. That That is certainly what I hunger for as well. Any upcoming events or announcements you want to make people aware of? Um, well, upcoming. I've... Well, my most recent book, if I might do a little plug here, yes, uh, is called 80 Day, Around the Bible in 80 Days. If you're interested in hearing about, okay, what story are you talking about? <laughs> How do you tell that story? Yeah. Then this 80 Days Around the Bible tells the story. And it tells it in like 500 word chapters, like a daily dose with a prayer and scripture reading and... Um, a meditative question, but Oof. we'll take you through the whole story in 80 days if you do a daily oh. devotional. Yeah, 80 days around the Bible. I'm gonna pick that up. Yeah. I'm I'm literally gonna pick that up. I've got your searching for the pattern. Um, you've got several books. The other thing, guys, I would say just briefly is he's authored several books um, that are incredibly helpful. You can go. I'll, I'll make sure I put. Uh, things in the description that help people get to things. John Mark, yeah. I, before we get to the uh, off the record, I just want to say that, and I mean this, and I know it sounds cliche and maybe even cheesy, but we, we really are with you and God 
is for you. And we truly thank you for stopping in today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a blessing for me as well. Absolutely. Well, before we get to the off the record interview that is available for the Patreon subscribers, I just want to say that in the next coming weeks, we are going to be having a slew of guests that is going to be phenomenal. Next week, I'm going to be interviewing Marilyn Crete. She's got a new book called The Book, uh, The Box Must Be Empty. And we are going to be having an off the record interview for her as well. The week after that, Stephen Lisa Johnson, where we're going to be discussing mutuality. And again, an off the record interview. Uh, Ed and Dab Anton, on and on. I've got several folks that are going to be joining us on very important topics. I will see you next time.